Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, thank you so much for joining us yet again for another conversation. And uh, I'm here with my longtime friends, Bob and Don Davis. Bob and Don, thank you so much for making time for all of us. We're excited to be here. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. It's been amazing to see you grow this podcast and to grow the audience following. I really think it's a, a nice organic feel you know, to the otherwise always really more tuned in professional podcasts. I, well, it, thank you. And that actually means a lot coming from you, Bob. I, I, one of the things that we've tried to do with the podcast is to be just that, to be very kind of laid back and conversational. Um, and because like you, when I listen to podcasts that feel kind of robotic and, and overly planned, overly produced and canned, and you hear this very kind of corporate style elevator intro music, um, I, I just, I automatically kind of check out. And so th that's really our goal with the podcast is just to have conversation between friends, whether new or old friends, and uh, hopefully add some type of value to our listeners at the end of the day. So uh, thank you. That, that really truly means a lot coming from you. And um, it's a little bit of a selfish project and that I just love having conversation. So I'm excited that I get to do that with you all here today. And, and we'll, like we normally do at the podcast, we'll just kind of jump right in and talk about something that we call our technique for time. So much of the book of podcasts is about how to create freedom free and flexibility for photography business owners. And so I'm curious what you and Don do in your lives and your businesses to create more space for yourselves, for each other. Don, I'll let you begin. Gosh, it, we were, it's, <laughs> it's a never ending battle, finding balance. And I'm sure that everybody that comes on the show can say the same thing. You can feel really good in one area of your life of running a business. And then you feel like the family's lacking or the marriage is lacking or uh, taking care of yourself is lacking. And so finding that balance is just, it's just a, a never ending chase, I think. For sure. Um, but you know, the one thing that Bob and I do is, is that any time that either one of us is feeling stressed out, we literally tell each other, we both say, it's time for a walk. Let's go make dinner. Let's go do something and get out of the house because we work from home. So it's really important for us to not ever want what we do feel like a job. And so that, that, that by far is what we, we nurture the most is, is our marriage and we've always done that from day one, um, even having children. We've always said that our marriage is going to come first. Well, and, and to that very point, we're going to actually kind of dig into the conversation of working with your partner, running a photography business, working with your partner. When I first started in the industry, that was kind of a, a unique concept. It's become much more popular. And so I'm, I'm excited that we get to have your perspective today on the podcast about that very topic. But when you talk about realizing or there's a certain amount of self-awareness, I guess, of your stress levels mounting through the day or through the week, and you know that you need to take a break. You mentioned getting out and taking a walk. Is there, is there anything else in particular that you do? I know that you're both kind of avid, not work out, or what is the term even? People who like to work out, you're very active. <laughs> yeah, we both, we both love to work out. Bob does CrossFit three or four times a week. And um, I'm, I'm much more of a, a not gym person. I like to work out at home, so I do the Beach Body On Demand. Well, that's another thing that helps me with balance is getting out of the house to go exercise and be a part of that community. Yes. You know, because as I'm getting older, I wanted something to physically challenge me more and CrossFit has done that, but I wanted to find a CrossFit gym that gives good instruction because, you know, at 55, I don't need my ego getting in the way and then getting an injury which, right. you know, you can have happen very easily. <laughs> well, but I have to give you major props, Bob, you and I have had the opportunity to spend and, and Don for that matter as well, a lot of time together over the years at a variety of conferences. 
And it particularly sticks out in my mind hearing that Bob is coming back and we're getting ready to go to breakfast in the morning uh, at WPPI or whatever it might be. And, and I'm hearing about Bob has just finished a workout and he's coming back from his workout or he did this workout in his room with a video. I know that both of you have done that. Uh, Don, you just spoke to that. But the consistency with which you all take care of, kind of proactively take care of your health is a really, really great and an inspiring example for all of us. And, and when it comes to kind of minimizing stress, I mean, that's one of the first steps to doing that very thing. Um, not only giving yourself a mental, emotional, psychological break from work, because it can be quite taxing, but then also taking care of yourself physically, which then sets you up to be um, of a clearer mind when you do go back to work. So I think this is a wonderful example for our listeners. And I, I have to just give you major props. And, and I mean, the, the fact that, you know, you say you're 55, the energy that you both carry, I would, I would never guess your age, both in your, your chemistry and in your relationship, but then as individuals as well. So uh, major props to you both. No, thank you, Nathan. It's, thank you. It's, uh, it, it all really, really starts with Bob. He lost his parents at a very young age. And so health is extremely important to him. And, you know, I pretty much just follow Bob's lead in almost everything he does in life. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, true, it's but true. Not, she's not a minion. Please oh, don't God. get that <laughs> opinion because Dawn is very strong-willed <laughs> and strong-minded. And that's one of the things I ultimately respect about her. But like Dawn said, though, you know, I've had a lot of wake up calls in my life and I continually get them. I'm watching our older relatives as they age and I'm really paying attention. Like, I don't want to live that way. Yeah. I want to grow old and be active and do things, not be sedentary, you know, and you hear procedures. And in fact, all my friends that I've grown up with since sixth grade, they're, most of them can't see their belt buckle. You know, yeah. so and then they look at you and or Don and I are like, well, you guys are lucky you have a fast metabolism. I'm like, again, no luck isn't in it. Sure, it's part of it, but we make it a point. That's part of my I, I'm a little bit more selfish than Don is about my time. I admire Dawn's dedication to where if she sits down to work on something to get it done, man, she could she could sit down for 12, 14 hours and plow through and get it done. I just can't do that. I get stammied, I get uh, less productive. So I'll break and I'll say, I got to go play with the dog. I'm going to go for a bike ride or I'm going to go have a workout. And I'm able to just drop it, walk away and come back and I'm better off. I'm able to do that too, but I need a reminder because <laughs> he's right. I do plow through. I'm a tasker. He's, he's the dreamer and I'm the doer. That's true. Well, and I'm curious, actually, that this conversation about time independence ultimately um, is a really interesting kind of segue into our conversation later on with regards to your relationship and kind of how you maintain that that passion within the relationship over a long term. So we'll get to that here in just a little bit. I want to come back to it. I think it's very fascinating. Uh, but to this conversation about how everyone listening in, if you're not prioritizing, even just spending 20 or 30 minutes a day to at least get out and take a walk, if not do more, can't recommend it enough. And, you know, it's interesting, Bob, you're talking about um, kind of the health scares that you've had over the years, whether yourself personally or within your family. One of the things that happened to me a few years back, um, I had a pretty significant wake up call. I mean, I'd begun to lose weight, but I just didn't feel as alert mentally or, or functioning physically like I had in, in years past. And so I actually went and got a, a blood panel, not just the blood panel that you get when you go to get your, you know, and your physical, but a, I, I think the report that I got back had maybe between seven and nine pages worth of results that essentially made me feel almost like a, like a robot, like a machine. And it was really fascinating because as you say, it's, it's easy to just kind of use the cop out. Well, so-and-so has a fast metabolism or they're just naturally healthy. But the reality is at the end of the day, 99% of us uh, function very, very similarly. Uh, there are caveats to that, but if you're actually willing to look at your body as a machine and treat it accordingly, that the metaphor actually works out really, really well. And so I was able to make very proactive adjustments to not just my diet, uh, which I had already begun improving, but also even to the types of uh, shampoos or body washes that I was using and the components that I was using. Uh, One million percent. Yeah, yes. the tools that I was using in the kitchen even because that kind of stuff can affect your hormones and, and being aware of how even your hormone levels stand uh, is really, really important. So be very proactive with your health. It translates on multiple levels and we'll feel the better for it. Right. I, I can't even, I could, I could talk for eight hours about that. It's 
very, very, very important toxins and toxic, toxicity. It's, it's incredible what it does to the human body over, over a long period of time. And take control of that now is the best gift that you can give yourself. It really is. But it, it, most people go to the easy and big box advertising like Tide and, and all these big name brands. It just, it, it makes you feel like you're doing the right thing by using the most advertised product. And essentially we're just all brainwashed. Well, and, <laughs> but, and it's interesting that you make, make mention of that though, because uh, I think there is, it's, it's easy to say, well, Everybody else uses that stuff and they seem to be, quote, okay. But again, there is, while some of this might kind of seem out there and a little bit hippie, the reality is that we can actually look at our bodies scientifically. We can look at the numbers and use that data as a baseline and then look for ways to improve. So, for example, on, on a more tangible level, I know that naturally I tend to run uh, or was running low on vitamin B12 and vitamin D. And so I could very proactively not only take supplements, but then also adjust my diet or know that I needed to spend more time out in the sun than I was. Yeah. There, are, there are very tangible changes that we can make based on actual data. It's not so-and-so said this or does this or doesn't do this. We can actually make our decisions scientifically. And so there's opportunity to do that. And uh, without belaboring the, the subject, I'd, I'd highly recommend any and everyone to, to take your health a little bit more seriously and act on it proactively and, and you'll benefit from it, not only personally, but also professionally too. So I want to move a different direction here. I, I'd love to hear, and actually I can even, if something pops into mind as I'm about to ask this question, but tell us something random that most people don't know about each of you. Well, I want to say that I'm an absolute introvert. Um, people probably would never guess that because when I'm out and about, I, I can be very, very social, but Truly, I'm, I don't, it takes a lot for me to walk into a room, especially by myself. If I have my husband on my arm, everything's fine. But if I have to walk into a room by myself and, and start talking or networking, it's super hard for me. And I have to really talk my way through that. So yeah, I would say that most people would never guess that I'm a homebody. I'm an introvert. I, I can be extroverted when I need to be, but yeah, that would, that would be my my thing. That is interesting. And I, I wouldn't necessarily guess that about you. When, and, and I know a lot of photographers define themselves as introverts. How do you define that, Don? Well, Bob and I have different definitions of introvert because he said to me, you're not an introvert. You're just a homebody. <laughs> um, and I said to him, no, he said, because you can walk into a room and you can talk to you know everybody there. And yeah. I said, when, if you're on my arm, absolutely I can, because I feel comfortable and safe. But when I don't feel comfortable and safe, I'm very out I'll just sit in the corner. And so an introvert to me, I, Bob said our daughter's more of an introvert and I know what he means by that. I'm, I am exclusive. I don't just, we don't, even if you look on our social media, not a lot of it is personal. The good stuff is great, but I, I don't share. I'm very particular and I'm very exclusive when it comes to what I share with who. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. All right, so so Bob, uh, Dawn shared the, the random fact about herself. Take us to something just totally random that most people don't know about you. Wow. Um, he actually very, very much struggled with this question. Sure, it's like, what do you want to put out there? What I, are, what's to hide? No, nothing to hide. It's, it's just, in, in some ways, I'm exclusive, like Dawn says. I don't need to surround myself with a bunch of friends, just sure. a handful of really close friends. Things things about me that probably no one knows is I I grew up riding horses. I love horses. I love spending time in the country and being with animals. And and another thing uh, is is confidence. It might only seem you know we shoot big ridiculous events and and big ballrooms of events. And this even goes back to my photojournalism days. I've always wanted to participate and be a part of the big event, but then right before your confidence gets really nerve wracking, like, am, am I worthy? Am I sure? Should I be here? Sure. And that still happens to this day, you know, and what I've found that's been helpful before every event and before anything that's really going to kind of get to your confidence level is to meditate. Yes. That's another thing I've been learning mm -hmm. that you just self-talk instead of your mind can go to a negative place with all those thoughts like, am I worthy? Can I pull this off? Do I deserve to be here? You start turning that around and start, you know, telling yourself about your successes. You're confident. You know your craft. You know what you can do. And then once I start photographing, boom, then all that goes away. 
but you still get those. It's, it's more than butterflies. It's not just butterflies of excitement. It's like, Oh, can I really do this? Can I really live up to the expectations? You know, I, I still pinch myself that I'm in the company of my photographic heroes being a member of the Canon Explorer of Light. Like, really? I'm not worthy. How did I get here? And, and you say that, and yet uh, I still think back to you. You just mentioned in passing your photojournalistic career, but even just your experience in that realm before you even moved into wedding photography was impressive in and of itself. Uh, I'm sure Don can, can uh, share the accolades. But then when it came to wedding photography, the celebrities that you've had the opportunity to work with, both in wedding and, and general event photography, uh, is really incredible. But I, I love your vulnerability and willingness to kind of share that apprehension that you still experience, because I know a lot of photographers... Uh, can relate to that. It's funny, you mentioned meditation. This has been a point of conversation for the last um, three interviews that I've done here at Boca. And I want to dig into it just a little bit here because I want, I'm curious about your approach to it. Meditation looks different for different people. Do you have a, a ritual of sort that you, that you follow when you go about meditation? I do. I, I've, I've tried a lot of different techniques for meditation. And I just don't think I'm disciplined enough to sit down and meditate. So it works for me as guided meditation. Okay. So, you know, you could go to Chopra.com and they have examples of guided meditations. Yeah. Those work really well for me because then they start guiding you like, okay, focus on your breath and do this. And boom, that I can immediately hold on to and I can relate to. And find relief from. And find relief from. You know, I mean, we, we've all had struggles, you know, with raising children and things like that and and finding your center because you could really become unhinged when you're trying to guide your children in the right way. But they're young adults, as they should be, and making their decisions. And you got to allow them to make mistakes yes. but guide them so they don't make mistakes that are harmful to themselves. And meditation really helped me to remain level with that and not like, don't you know what I'm trying to tell you here is value, you know, <laughs> which is what you want to do. <laughs> right. Instead of going off the deep end. And then I really started it with that and I realized the value of it for everything. For everything. So when I'm driving into the city to, a, we just had a big event and, you know, the, the bride was kind of, she's a producer. So she's really on point and really knows what she wants. And, and it's all good things. But I had to meditate for that so that I didn't let her level of energy mm. affect mine. Wow. Wow. There's so many different directions that we could go here. I, I have to go back to the point that you made about parenting because I'm sure plenty of our listeners are parents as well. And they struggle with that balance between uh, making sure that, well, very simply, as you pointed out, Bob, that, that their kids are free from or safe from harm, at least to any kind of great extent, uh, but then also giving them the space, the opportunity to learn to make choices. And I don't know if I've spoken about this on the podcast before, but it was something that I've, I have struggled with quite a bit over the years, the notion of choice. And of course, that translates to my work in business as well, because I wasn't raised in an environment where I had a lot of freedom for choice, and not just because of my parents, but uh, other environments that I was, I was in it as well. And so I didn't know what it meant to make a choice, even simple choices for myself. And that translated to a lack of confidence as an adult. And so I think it's really important. Uh, this is not a parenting podcast, but I think it's a great point that you make to learn to, to give your kids the space to learn to make choices for themselves. As long as they're not going to suffer any significant harm uh, as a result, it's good for them to learn to make choices and see the consequences and make adjustments because that skill translates to running a business. It's easy to get caught up in the, dis the next decision you're going to make for your business. Do is this the right one? Is it going to translate to growth? Is it going to hurt me? Am I going to lose this thing or that? But the reality is at the end of the day, nobody has the exact answer and we have to be willing to take uh, or to have a little bit of confidence in our choice to move forward. And if we need to, we can course correct after the fact. And it's a, a great skill to develop. Well, that's a great point that you brought up is having the ability to, to step back for a moment and course correct right. to see the effects of things. I mean, there, there are decisions we've made in our business that monetarily have held, I shouldn't say held us back, but it was a conscious decision because we wanted to do more things with our children and be present there because running your own business is the hardest thing Dawn and I have ever done, but it's also the most rewarding. And there's times where I could get blind. Raising children is by far the hardest thing. We've sure. Ever done. Roll it all in together. That's yeah. that balance. Yeah. And there's sometimes where an opportunity will present itself and you want to go for it, but then you realize the effect it could have 
and then well, we pull back. Yeah, I think I think the the key the key for us. Well, we're, I mean, we're pretty much done with raising our children. Our children are now nineteen and twenty, soon to be twenty one, twenty and twenty one. But we we created our business from scratch, from the bottom up, when our kids were little toddlers. Yeah. So it. You know, I mean, I feel like we could totally write a book on the things that we did that were really great and the things that we did that were like not so great, <laughs> but we did it. And I, and I think it's doable for anybody, but the, the most important key I think is just communication. Oh yeah. And, and we could do a whole probably series of podcast episodes just on that, yeah. that topic as it relates to both our personal lives and our professional lives. It, it really yeah. is huge making sure that you, you maintain open lines of communication that, that your kids or for that matter, your business partners, uh, or associates or whatever it might be, know that there is always room for conversation and that there is consistent and, and open communication there. It's so, so important. Yeah. And, you know, you, you spoke about business. So I'd, this is a great segue into my next question. Just a little bit about the background of the business, about how maybe you got started in photography, Bob. I know that's more specific to you, but then how you all started the business as well. Well, photography is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. And I've been blessed enough to be able to go after it and make it happen. Meaning it, he's been making a living being a photographer. That's all I've ever done. That's all he's ever done. You know, I, going back to what Don said, I did lose my parents at an early age, and I did mm. bounce around with different relatives and things, and that wasn't always a good thing. Yeah. But then I did have one relative who was trying to look out for me, and he was my father's brother, Michael George, and, and he said, look, I'll I'll pay for your college education, but you got to give up this photography thing. You're decent in math. You have a good imagination. I want you to be an engineer. So I kind of paused for a second. I said, well, okay. You know, I respected him and he was willing to pay for it. So I took him up on that opportunity. I went for a year and a half with engineering classes and design classes. But I was just inside dying. You know, like you're you're working and you're realizing I'm going to have to do this for the rest of my life. And I, I said, I called my uncle George and I said, uncle George, look, I really, really greatly appreciate everything you've done. And I'm so thankful that you made this opportunity for me, but I got to give this photography thing a try. So I, and I have to interject here, Bob, because for those, for those who don't or haven't had the the privilege to know Bob personally, I, I can imagine, I can picture you sitting in that, in those classes, instead of paying attention to whatever they were talking about with regards to engineering or otherwise, um, and you know, noticing something funny about the person's clothing or something random that the, that the classmate across the room was doing. You you have, and, and I, I mean this in the best way possible, you have a, a kid's mind and imagination. And I love the mischievousness that comes out. <laughs> and, and literally in your day-to-day life, I've seen this in the way that you interact with, with Don, uh, with your kids as well. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think it helps us stay young. And it's probably one of the reasons why you have such a young energy about you. But I, I just had the pain that picture for those listeners who, who don't know you personally he's very mischievous he's very very he's very naughty a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> i'm always 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 shaking my head it's 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 always funny when it's not your husband. Yeah, well, at least keeps in- things interesting. But Bob, I didn't um, mean I didn't mean to interrupt no, the train of thought there. No, please, I, please, please I continue. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, you, that leads back to you. You can't take it all too seriously. You know, yeah. at least for, for us, it yeah. works taking it too seriously. You know, everybody puts their pants on the same way, one leg at a time. And, and it's it, a great equalizer. It takes a village. It takes a village to get a job done. So, you know, everybody has a part in that and you need to be respectful and thankful for all of it and everybody. It's it's very, very true. Well, t- take us back then, Bob. You're, you're, you had the opportunity to go to class. You realize this isn't for you, so you're going to make this transition. to You need to give photography a try. What did it look like from there? So from there, uh, when I get focused on something, I can be very tenacious. So I immediately started calling a few of the local newspapers. So when I was in high school, I was able to sell some of my photographs to the local weekly newspaper, the uh, Southtown Economist. And they were they would buy the photographs for like 15 bucks for a couple eight by tens from our high school sports. So that was great. And I realized, hey, there might be something there. So I immediately called them up and started asking for any t- opportunity to freelance or an internship, you know, and, and calling the other suburban small weekly newspapers that were around Chicago. 
And that started to bear fruit. And I also enrolled myself at Columbia College. So my first year at Columbia College, my first semester, also I got a full year internship with a daily small newspaper, the daily South County Economist. They had a weekly and a daily. Okay. And so I was going to school full time and I was working in photojournalism full time because again, my uncle was like, well, I'm not going to support that. You know how many photographers there are out there, starving artists trying to make a living. And he's like, you got to give it a try, but you'll be back. I'm like, well, at least if I give it a try and I fail, I know I've tried. Yes. I'll get it out of my system. Yes. And I think the tenacity and never taking no for an answer has been a big beacon in my life. Even, even with Dawn (laughs) relentlessly pursuing her. Yeah. I was tough. I was super tough. It paid off. So to make a long story short thing, one thing led to another. And at the beginning of my junior year, I was the college photographer of the year. I won another scholarship, which was helpful, but then I got, you know, a full-time position offered to me at the newspaper. So I took that. And I dropped out of college because I started traveling, you know, with the Bulls and the Chicago White Sox for sports. So I couldn't go to school full time and work full time. And the career was advancing faster than school. So I said, well, I'm going to drop out. And that really hasn't hurt me at all because I knew photographers that had master's degrees from Northwestern University, the Bill School of Journalism, that couldn't find a job where, you know, I was constantly striving to produce the best photography possible and being, again, tenacious and driven to t- get those big stories and storytelling images that it kept advancing my career. Well, and, and honestly, I mean, it, I've, I've already alluded to the possibility of multiple episodes with probably various conversations that we've had thus far. I could really dig into your photojournalistic background, Bob, because it's quite interesting to me. And I mean, you, you mentioned the Bulls, and of course, you had the opportunity to photograph Michael Jordan and others. Uh, I think it's really, really fascinating. But for the sake of time in our conversation today, maybe fast forward for us then to the transition from uh, working at the paper into wedding and event photography. There's, there's no better school to prepare you for anything photographically than photojournalism because at a demanding, large, metropolitan newspaper, you have to produce an image that's going to appear in print. Yeah. And my picture editor always said, Bob Katalik always said to me, kid, come back with a good picture or don't come back at all. We can't publish an excuse. And he meant it. So I've embraced that my entire life. Life. So fast forward to 2004, I got burnt out on bad news. Just too, I was too good at it. For whatever reason, people welcomed me into their life and would tell you their whole story and let you photograph them on this journey on their worst day. And I never would refuse an assignment. And finally, you know, once you have children and you're raising a family, you're like, okay, there's younger people underneath me. I have some seniority. I don't want to do any more dead people stories. Wow. You know, yeah. I, it's enough. It, it starts eating away at your soul. Sure. It really did for me. And so there was a big incident in Chicago in December of 2003. It was a nightclub called the E2, where after hours, they locked the club down and the party kept going. Well, then a fire broke out and then people got trampled and stomped and trapped at the exits. And there was like eight or nine people that died. Wow. So I had to cover that story. I, I, for some reason, this family opened up to me and I'm, I'm going with this little boy who's with his grandma picking out a casket for his dad. And, oh. you know, you're, you're on this whole journey with them and you, if you're not emotionally involved, your pictures aren't going to be good. Yeah. At least from my perspective. So I did the story and I said, that's it. I quit afterwards. I said, I told you guys, if you send me on one more of these, you're, I was going to quit. And they didn't believe me. Well, who would? I mean, it took you five, seven, 10, I don't know how many years to get into the Chicago Sun-Times. And then it was a union job. Nobody ever left. Everybody were lifers. And so when he left, they were, everybody was shocked. So, you know, that was at a good point to actually get away because you could see the writing on the wall that newspapers weren't evolving with the way news is being delivered. For example, you know, the smartphones, internet, things of that nature. And 2004 was before smartphones, but you had palms, you know, and so you'd be able to log into AOL or something and see news. Sure. 
they get news feeds and they just weren't evolving. And you could kind of see things were changing and they were reluctant to change with it. I've always loved weddings. I mean, I photographed my first wedding for my relative in high school. I was more drawn to authentic images and storytelling images. So I think with the advent of reality TV, the audience changed. So while it's still important to do pose photography and beautiful family portraits and those sets of things, people also are drawn to authenticity and storytelling real moments as well. And so that was perfect for us, for Don and I, to hit the ground running in 2004 and start working on a wedding brand. So what, I guess, I mean, this is such a loaded topic, but but Don, maybe share a little bit of your side of the story in this too, this transition Bob made, Bob made from, from working at the newspaper now to moving into wedding and event photography. You're starting a business. I know that you have an accounting background, correct? Correct. Yeah. I was a nine to fiver for like 16 years. And towards the end of that, I was feeling like the last three years, I was really feeling trapped. And it was really, really difficult doing something every day, nine to five, the same thing. You know, he would, I'd come home from work and Bob would tell me all about his incredible day, you know, up in a helicopters, sitting with the president, uh, you know, go, I mean, he was just, he had such amazing stories. And it's one of the reasons why I fell in love with him. He was just really, really cool to, 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 to be part of that with him. Yeah. To, to come home from a nine to five and every day he'd say, how was your day? And I'd say, well, I balanced, you know, I mean, it just, there, I was, I think I was angry and I was taking it out on him. And in 2005 is when I really developed, God came into my life and I developed a relationship with him all via a book that was landed on my desk by my boss called The Prayer of Jabez by Bruce Wilkinson. And it's really this tiny, tiny little book, but it was written for me. <laughs> it was something I needed at that time. And after I read it, I quit my job two weeks later and I had been with this company for six years. Wow. So, yeah. And, and I know that a lot of a lot of people listening in, in fact, we may have some that are, they're itching to start a photography business. They're not sure about how to make that shift out of a corporate environment or office environment. What was, what was the element of that book that kind of created that shift that, that pushed you out of the office? Sure. I'll quickly go into it because I can I can tell I could talk about it forever since I'm just so indebted to my love for my relationship with God. But it is the book is about um, a four line prayer in the Bible. It's a passage by Jabez, and it is, "O oh Lord, I ask that you bless me indeed, that you expand my territory, that you put your hand on me, and that you guide me from evil." And the book basically just goes into um, what each and every one of those four lines means. And it really taught me that God is my father. And as, as a parent myself, I know that when my children are in need, I want them to come to me and I want them to ask me for help and I want to be able to guide them. And I never looked at God like that before. I wasn't raised around a church. Um, I don't know scripture. I'm, I'm learning it today, but I still have a long ways to go. My relationship is very raw and personal and I don't really, I don't really want scripture to ruin my relationship. And I know that sounds funny and, and it won't, um, but I don't want to be that person. I want to have a private personal relationship with him. And, and basically what I, what I learned is that I, I cry to him constantly. Now I thank him. I think about him first and foremost, before I think about anything or anybody, he comes first. So any words that come out of my mouth, I think about Am I going to, is he going to be, is he going to be shaking his head at me or is he going to be like, good job, Don? And I really feel that once God came into our lives, our entire life changed, everything changed. And that's when I quit my job. I took a leap of faith and I said to him, I, I, I read this book. I'm laying in bed one night. Bob doesn't even know this. And I just said, I, I am so tired of one step forward, 10 steps back. Everything, Bob and I used to have a motto and it was, if it was easy, it wasn't meant for us. Everything was difficult for us. Everything, everything from adopting our children to have becoming parents, everything, everything. And we made a joke about it. You know, we would laugh about it. We'd be like, well, of course, you know, it's like Murphy's law. If, it, if it's supposed to be easy, it certainly wasn't meant for us. And I had to learn to change that mindset. And I had to learn to start crying out for help. And as soon as I started doing that, everything changed. I'm talking the day after everything changed. 
Um, and, and it just hasn't changed and it hasn't stopped since then. So there, there isn't a day that I don't go by without thanking God or talking to him con- religiously and continuously. Um, it's the most important thing in my life. So would you say then that it was that, that newfound strength that you found in him that, that enabled you then to say, all right, I'm going to take this leap of faith. I'm, I'm getting out of this environment that I've not been particularly happy with and, and make this move into full-time photography? One million percent. Wow. One million percent. Even to this day, I think what I think the biggest gift it gave me was the ability to say, okay, I can't do this. It's yours. I need you and you need to do something with this. Because now I don't really fear anything. And I know that sounds weird to say that you don't fear anything. I don't fear death. I don't fear, I don't really fear anything. I think the biggest thing that I fear is not having, not feeling him in my life. Well, and, and this is at this end, and again, multiple topics that we've covered thus far are, are really loaded. Um, and, and we only have so much time today, but I'm sorry, I, yes. not yes. at all. No, no. And in fact, I, what I was going to say is I really appreciate you sharing again, being vulnerable and sharing your experience through that with our listeners. I, I know that, that taking that leap sometimes making the move. Um, in fact, I remember when I made the move from, from, part-time photography to full-time photography. I was, I was actually working in the optics industry. Most people don't know this about me, but I, w- I was a certified optician and I was working selling glasses and working with, with uh, people who were either buying their first pair or buying another pair and taking measurements and, and getting them set up. Uh, and I actually really enjoyed the industry, but I was working in an office at the time with, uh, it was actually a husband and, and wife team. Uh, that were running this particular practice. The husband was the doctor, the wife was the office manager. And very simply, there was some dishonesty going on in the practice and, and I just didn't want to be a part of it. And so one day I just, I'd had enough and, and let them know. And they were very quick to kind of push me away because of course they didn't want to be confronted about the dishonesty. And uh, so I came home and, and told my partner at the time, uh, I, I'm you know, basically, we're going full-time in photography or I'm going full-time in photography. It was just something that was kind of pushed on me. And many times, unless we have that life experience that kind of pushes us into the next phase, uh, it can be tough to make that, that decision. But uh, obviously, you all have made the right decision and you've benefited significantly from it. And, and of course, the wonderful thing, even more wonderful thing, is that, that so much of the world has benefited significantly from that. And so it, it's a fascinating journey. Maybe one of these days we can kind of dig into it in a little bit more detail. But when it comes to running a business, you've had the opportunity to run a business now for, what, about 15 years. What what has been one of the toughest lessons that you've learned that you can share with our listeners so that maybe they can avoid going through a similar experience? One of the toughest lessons for me, which Dawn is better at by far in, you know, it goes back to your roots a lot growing up, you know, my dad, we had a one bedroom apartment and I still have a few of his paychecks. I used to even write and pay bills when I was, you know, 13 years old was he was making like $177 a week. And this is back in 76. And so now when Dawn, we're targeting, we've identified our audience, it's the luxury brand, it's high end, you know, the whole idea of I work smarter, not harder. Yeah. You know, we have worked hard at everything. Dawn has set our prices at a high point. And then along comes a client that says, Hey, I've got uh, $4,000. Uh, would you shoot my wedding? And I'm thinking, wow, Allie needs braces. I've got nothing going this Saturday. My dad made 177 bucks a week. Are you kidding me? I'm there. You know, but the lesson is, is Dawn was correct that if you're going to build a brand, you can't undermine it and diminish it and undercut it because people talk. And that was a real struggle for me to honor her and say, yes, you are right. And then finally I said, you're right. I'm giving up. I have faith that this is going to work out and I'm going to trust in you. But that, that even still to this day, it's a struggle when someone will say, oh, we really can't book you. Can you come down to 8,500? You know, part of me is like, sure, I'm not doing anything. But Don's right. The minute you do that, you've given up the reins of your business. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I can actually relate to what you're saying, Bob. My, my perspective about finances was really that the, I guess, the baseline was set in my childhood. Uh, my, my parents didn't make a lot of money either. And so when I started getting checks for 1000 2000 3000 4000 6000 whatever dollars, I wasn't used to seeing that those amounts of money. And as a result, I, I didn't manage it very proactively. 
And that ultimately hurt me in my business. And, and it's, it's one of the first things that I'll tell any photographer. If there was a, a tough lesson that I learned, it was not managing my, my finances proactively. But yours is an interesting perspective in that whereas, you know, the kind of that, that scarcity mentality that you grew up in where you kind of get anything and everything that you possibly can for the sake of your brand, you've had to kind of stand your ground when it comes to maintaining the price point with which you offer your services. And so this is a really great segue into my next question and something we talk a lot about here on the podcast, which has to do with brand position. And Don, I'd love to hear your perspective on this too. But uh, Bob, I, I think you you mentioned it just a second ago, your brand is very much about luxury. Is that correct? Yes. it's It was extremely important to me. Bob and I, I don't know, for some reason, we were born with the need to want the best, not materialistically. Like if I was going to work in a restaurant, I certainly wouldn't work in Bob Evans. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Fair and enough. I don't, I, I, no disrespect. I, I don't mean any disrespect. So I hopefully didn't offend anybody. What I meant for that is I want, I've always had the drive to work smarter, not harder. If I'm going to work as a bartender, which I did, I didn't work at the local bar down the street. I worked in a club where when I walked home that, you know, when I left that night, I was two, three hundred dollars in cash in my pocket. Yeah. So I when we decided to go into business for ourselves, I knew immediately. And my I think what really solidified it for me was going to WPPI for the first time and listening to all those speakers up on on the stage and talking about their philosophy and talking about, you know, um, how to, how to get there. And I knew immediately that I was like, okay, my husband is an amazing photographer. I already know this. This man can shoot anything anywhere because of his journalistic career. And like Bob had mentioned earlier, don't, you know, get a good shot or don't come, don't come back at all. I knew that I could sell him. And so for me, it was, where is all of these big name people like Joe Busink and all of our, 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 our heroes and this industry, your Vant and, you know, they, we knew that they were very high priced and we knew what our market, at least I, I guessed at what our market would hold. And, and I worked our way up to that and I didn't take no for an answer. And there would be times that I would raise our pricing and Bob wouldn't talk to me for days because he didn't believe that he was worth it or we were worth it or whatever. He felt like Joe Busing had been in the wedding photography industry for so long. And we had to work that long to get in it too. And I just disagreed with that. And I always said to him, uh, if we need to go back, we can roll back. But I didn't in- ever intend on it. And and really, we just, we worked to get the luxury brand market because I didn't want to shoot 50 weddings a year. I wanted to shoot no more than 20. And that was a goal. And that was what we accomplished. And it took us you know, a couple of years to get there, but it, it, you know, we, we did it and we did it while we were raising babies, you know, and we were walking our kids to school and taking them to the doctor's appointments. You know, it was beautiful. It was such a great journey looking back on it. So this, this word luxury is one that's been kind of thrown around in our industry quite a bit. Um, it's easy for somebody to call themselves a luxury photographer. It's another thing to actually be it. Part of that, part of what drives that, that word, I guess it certainly is price point And I know that you're charging upwards of ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars for a wedding. That that would automatically put you in the top five percent very easily. Actually, probably closer to the top one to two percent of weddings photographed, certainly in the U.S. market. Uh, so price is one factor, but then the other element um, that goes along with that is the experience as well. So I'm curious, how do you communicate this brand position to potential clients, whether it's through your website or through the relationships or otherwise? Well, well, let me just say one thing. Sure. What I what I think really helps define Don and I from other husband and wife teams or luxury wedding photography brands is Don's the secret weapon. She's not a photographer. She's great at business. She's great at relating, and she knows what women love. Mm. So, Don, for me. There is so much talent in Chicago. There is so much cha- talent in the States, or worldwide. I mean, if we were to sit back and look at other people's work, we could really like be very harmful to ourselves sure. over it. Because it, it's people are extremely talented, probably way more talented than both Bob and I. But that's not what we sell. Bob and I sell an experience we well, first of all we our work can back up our pricing 
So I know, I know that for sure. And I know a lot of other photographers work can back up their pricing as well. But for us, it's about an experience. Like you said, Nathan, it's, it's, are we a good fit? So even when we go and meet with potential brides and their families, because we usually meet the family, the parents are usually paying for the wedding. It's not just a fit for them as we are, are saying the first thing I usually say when I walk into a client meeting, and I just said this a couple days ago when we walked in is we're not here to sell you. We're not here. We're here to see if we're a good fit for each other. And I hope that when we walk out the door that, you know, that we'll be a great fit for each other, but ultimately whoever you choose for your photography, I want you to be so happy because it's the one person you're going to spend the entire day with. And that is what's driven our business. I think we've got a couple event planners and, um, and it's, it's true. I don't know why people look at other photographers as competition because there's nobody like you. It's you that you're selling. It's an experience that you're selling. Unless you're going for high volume, that's different. But for us, we knew we wanted a boutique brand. And we know what that audience is. You know, our client, if they travel, they're going to stay at the Four Seasons or the Ritz. They're going to drive Mercedes, Lexus. I mean, we've we've really delved into where they're going to shop for for dresses. They're, They're going to buy a Vera Wayne Couture or some other designer that they have made to order. It's usually not off the rack. And then we did our diligence about, okay, what vendors cater to those people? What lighting company, what floral company, what decor company? And for us, we began our luxury brand by marketing to them because they're the gatekeepers to our audience. Our client doesn't spend a lot of time on Google search. Right. And keywords, it's more of, word of, of a mouth. word of mouth yeah. for sure, and referrals, because that clientele is very close knit, and they talk to one another. Yeah. So if one person used you and they trust you and they like what you did, that leads to more so referrals. And, and that's super important to me. I think the integrity and the authenticity that Bob and I have built in our business over the last fifteen years has been vital. And it's, it's not just vital for our business, it's vital for me as a human being and to be in a marriage with somebody that I believe in and that I can feel proud of and that I know that he's got my back, I've got his back and that we can check each other into, bring it back down to reality. I certainly, I certainly don't feel like we need to live in our client's world because we can't, we, we don't make the money that we, we far, far, far make from what our clients, but I don't think that you need to live in that world to work with them. You know, you need to create that experience, the service, the level of service that, that Don and I bring to our clients. There's times where we knew we weren't a right fit for a a client. And I said, we've said to them, Don and I both, Hey, check this other person. I think they're a better fit for your personality and what you're looking for. And yet they would keep calling us back like, what do you think this, how do you think this would photograph? How do you think, because you developed that relationship and trust and then down the road that pays dividends. Yeah, because they'll refer their friends to us, even though we didn't photograph their wedding. So you made mention there multiple times of the significance of relationships. And and, uh, I, I would agree with you, Don, we don't necessarily have to make the same amount of money as our clients to be able to understand them well enough to work with them. It does start with the relationships, connecting with the right people that act as then referrals to those potential clients. Uh, You also spoke to the significance of empathy, which I think is just, I mean, we can't emphasize that enough. Understanding whether it's a high-end client or not, understanding how our client thinks, what they're interested in, learning to speak their language is so, so important. And then, of course, that translates to to the experience that we create for them, uh, which, uh, again, can't be emphasized enough. As much as uh, the, the photographic artist wants to put you know, more emphasis than ever on the art itself, which is in and of itself extremely significant, we have to remember at the end of the day that the experience, and, and many if not most cases, is ultimately what's going to set us apart from the, the high-end or the low-end market or just from our fellow photographers. So uh, it's important to keep these ideas in mind. I think these are really important for our listeners. But Don, you also spoke to the, the chemistry that you and Bob have, your relationship and how that has kind of driven your ability to be able to work in this particular market. So I think that's a great, uh, yet again, another great segue into really our primary topic for today, which is your relationship. And I know we've hit all, all types of topics. For, for the sake of time, I want to respect your time. I'd love for you to comment just briefly 
specifically on how that relationship ultimately has benefited your business and, and Bob, more specifically, your work as a photographer? Well, the, the relationship is utmost. And knowing that Don believes in me inspires more confidence. And it's allowed me the freedom to forget and worry about the money coming in and to focus on serving the client. In the end, like Don said, there's so much great talent out there, but it's how you serve your client in that you can meet their needs or that you can anticipate. If you could see the mother or the bride is a little bit nervous, she may need a drink of water. I'm not above saying, hey, can I get you a glass of water? Could I do this for you? Can I do that for you? That's all at that level of service that a lot of other photographers don't do. They're there to just shoot and they're going to shoot for themselves most often. They're looking for big cinematic images, things that are going to win awards at WPPI. And nothing wrong with that, but for us and for me, it's more serving. How can I use my craft and my artistry to serve them in a way that they're going to look back on years from now and appreciate? And so ultimately there, I mean, very simply what we're talking about here is, is, is playing on each other's strengths and, and that chemistry ultimately enabling the business model. Is that right? Definitely. It, it, for, for Dawn and I, a, a big part of it is it's, that comes down to respect respecting each other. We're both passionate about what we do. We're passionate about our marriage, our relationship, our business, our family, our children. And oftentimes that passion causes us to bump heads because we both are strong people. But at the end of the day, we recognize that we're coming at this not out of any malice or harm, but out of passion. And then you realize that each of us are trying to do the best for each other and for our business. I think you always describe it beautifully when you talk about the two rooms. Well, yeah, I got inspired by Elton John and Bernie Taupin. It's very much how Don and I work. You know, Elton John, I'm kind of the show pony, like Elton John. You trot me out there, I go speak, or I'm shooting, you got to be fun and all, all those sets of things and capture the image. Where Elton writes the lyrics in one room and Bernie Taupin writes the music in another room and it just goes together so beautifully. So while I do the shoot and I come back. If I sat in front of the computer, I'm not always confident about what do you do now, right? I know how to do it to get it in camera. And Don takes that and finishes that image beautifully, just the way I envisioned it. And Don, what is what does that look like? I mean, it, it, Bob's out doing the actual shoot, is photographing the events. He's the, the, the so-called artist, but he's bringing that work home what does your role look like on the other, other side of that? What does the other side of this, this chemistry look like? Well, I do the, after Photographer's Edit does their work for us, which we absolutely love and can't live without. Then I just go through and I put my touch on it. So I get the catalog back from Photographer's Edit. Bob actually does the call now and sends it off to Photographer's Edit. Once it comes back, I take it over from there. And so I'll just put my little spin on it. I'll make sure my girls look good. I... I know that you feel like I probably do a little bit too much time, um, but I do. I'm very sensitive to um, the bride and the bride's mom yeah. and making sure that they look amazing. So their skin looks great. Everything looks great. And, um, and then I, I, I you know, send off the images to the client and I start working on book design immediately. So my goal is that after they get their images, they have their book design approved in three months. So that they get their book from Graphy Studio. We we use Graphy Studio. So they have their book. I, I don't want anybody being on my plate for longer than a year. And so my goal is like six months after the wedding is over to have their book in their hands. Which is an incredible standard for all of us to live up to. I, I know that some clients take so much time to, to actually give photographers feedback with regards to the album design in particular. And that process can get drawn out a year or even longer. So that's... That's really, really well, impressive. We started there, you know, because we didn't know. But every single time I have any kind of a, a hiccup with a client, I immediately go to my contract. And so that's taken care of with the next weddings, you know, upcoming weddings. So in my contract, it says that there's a time frame in my contract that says once your images are supplied to you within 30 days or within two weeks, you'll have your book design. And within three months, you need to have it all approved. I will pick the images and you will have two rounds of unlimited revisions. 
And then I put a very big hefty fee in there if they're going to go over that. So I, 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 I stress and I'm very communicative with our clients about, hey, can I help you? Is there anything that I can do? You, you've got this much time left. I know it may not seem like a lot of time, but it's going to be here before you know it. You need to get your book design done. And they love that. When I We talk about that in our meeting too, before we even sign with them. Okay. And they love that because they'll maybe had another photographer that they worked with for maybe one of their other children and they never got a book because they just never sat, sat down to pick pictures or work with a photographer. And I make that my goal. I mean, that's my job. I'm not a photographer. So that is my job. It's my responsibility. And I, I'm a list doer. I'm a, I, I, like I said in the very beginning, Bob's the dreamer and I'm the doer. And I don't like things staying on my list for very long. Well, but it's important to, to manage clients' expectations, to communicate, as you alluded to earlier. And I think this is a wonderful example and reminder for all of our listeners. Build that into the contract, but make sure, too, that there is very clear communication up front, during, and then after that event. And that's really important to maintain a even halfway decent timeline. But I want to get back to your relationship, because you mentioned something earlier uh, that stuck out to me, and it really reminds me of who you all are as a couple. You mentioned the word passion, and you are both definitely passionate individuals. And I love that because, I don't know, there's something about passion and, and kind of an edge and energy that just reminds you of the fact that somebody is alive. You know, they're not, they're not just sitting there, the bump on the log, and kind of reacting to any and everything. You all both have this very proactive mentality toward life, which is enviable. But you see it in your relationship, and, and you don't hide the occasions in which you're bumping heads, as you mentioned earlier. And, and, and I'm, I'm curious if you'll speak to that just briefly. Is that, has that been one of the biggest challenges you face as a couple working together? And if so, how, how do you work through that? I want to say it's my favorite thing in the world to do is work with him and sit with him. And I love nothing more than doing this business and sharing my life with him and raising children with him. It's a challenge and it's, but it, there's so much passion in our marriage and so much joy that we see on a daily basis that we enjoy going for walks together. We're the couple that still we walk from our bedroom to our kitchen holding hands sometimes. I mean, it's really ridiculous. <laughs> we're, just, we're just really loving to each other and to people, you know? I don't know. I just, I love, I, I, I love being married to him. No, I want, I, it's, it's that, that, that old saying of you want to strangle the neck of the head you want to rest on, you know, or the shoulder you want to rest your head on. Right. You and, want to wring the neck of the person whose shoulder you want to rest your head on. Yeah. And that. <laughs> That happens often, daily. daily. Oh, it, daily. It, it, it does, and it. But you it, didn't it, make the bed the right way. Why did you throw that pillow at me? I didn't talk to you that way. Why did you shut the door? You didn't even wait for me. <laughs> or if clients, you know, the, my phone rings first, and I talk about the photography, and they'll inevitably ask about money. And if I say, "Well, we begin at," John's like, Shh, sh, "Stop talking about money. That's my job." And I'm like, <laughs> "Am I supposed to say in the conversation? Wait a second. Let me give you the dawn for that." Yeah, because she's the. <laughs> Around the creek. No, I, I know, but those are the things that we kind of back and forth on, but we're very transparent about that. You are, and, and, and I really appreciate that because it's it's so easy to kind of put on a show on, on social media or otherwise and, and you know, try to paint this this kind of so-called perfect picture for everyone on the outside. You all don't hide that, but, but I'm curious because you do maintain a, a passion which is extremely positive too for each other. How do, you, how do you interact that way very passionately? I mean, you maintain a certain amount of independence, which reminds me of this book that I, re- that I read a number of years ago called Mating in Captivity, Esther Perel. And and she speaks. Oh, Esther Perel's great. Oh my goodness, it, it, she's amazing, and she speaks to the significance of independence and how that ultimately um, will help maintain passion in a relationship. It creates a positive tension. So you all have that. How yeah. do you how do you not let the I guess the temporary conflict or disagreements get in the way of the positive side of the relationship, especially when you're working together constantly? I'd like to address this, and I know that Bob will probably have something to say as well. When I married him, I knew that he was the type of man that was going to open the door for me when I was 80 years old. I just knew it. There's the way he pursued me. And there was nothing more admirable to me than the way a man loves his woman. Hmm. I knew the way he handled me that when I got into a marriage with him, that it was the only reason it was going to be messed up would be from me. And, and, and I think he feels the same way. And I, we innately both have this, genuine 
respect for our marriage that will always come first. And, and also, I have a great respect for him as a person, as a man who has such passion for life and, and really breathes that into me and makes me remember that there's more to the, what's happening right here and now. And to, to, he always says to me, Don, do you smell that? And he's like, he was Don. He'll, he'll grab me and he'll just go, stop. And he'll go, smell. And I'll be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's good. <laughs> but we do that for each other. You know, Dawn, I love her faith. Um, I was raised opposite. I was raised, I wasn't. I didn't have faith forced upon me. I was the only public in my family, meaning the only kid who went to a public school. You know, all the other kids and my cousins and relatives all, all had to go to Catholic private schools. So I was surrounded by all of that. But my father allowed me to make choices and decisions. But John has that innocent, beautiful spirituality and faith that I forgot about, you know, growing up with all the dogma and the rules and the this and the that and the guilt. And it was so liberating when she found her faith. I didn't not have faith, but the faith of being free in the same way that I say smell, she'll say, look at this, look at the beauty and abundance that surrounds us. There's something, there is a higher power that's that's enabling us to be on this journey. Yeah, when when Bob lost his job, so he left the he left the Chicago sometimes to work for a national wedding photography startup company, and he was there for I don't even know how many years. But when he got let go from that, he was devastated, and I never I'll never forget wrapping my hands around his face and just saying to him, "This is a gift." We are finally free. Look at Nathan. Look at the uh, Joy and Garrett. And look at these, these teams out there that, that are doing that. If they can do that, we can do this. We don't need anybody to work for. We can do this. And it was just incredible to see how we just move forward from that, from something that he felt so devastated by just blossom into this amazing business we've created. And just one other thing to add on that topic of disagreements is learning, and this is through just marriage development, learning that it's okay to argue and disagree, but do it with respect yeah. and stay on the topic. Don't bring up something that happened three years ago. Yeah. Just stay uh, like, okay, we disagree about how we're handling X, Y, or Z. Let's talk about that. Okay, I overstepped. I went into your duties. I'm sorry. Right. This was just my thought process on it. But we keep it on on target, and I will not use derogatory terms. Sure, I might yell and I might get passionate, but I'm not going to swear at Dawn. I'm not going to disrespect her that way. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes my mouth gets me in trouble, but I I do pray. I do pray specifically to think before I speak and speak before I yell. I, I really, um, grace is something that I've been working on for years and I'm getting so, so, so much better. But the one thing that Bob did touch on is that neither one of us hold a grudge. And I think, I truly, I say this all the time, I think that that's the reason why we have such a great marriage is because we can get into a, a balls out fight or argument over something. And then like 20 minutes later, I'm like, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're giving some wonderful tips and suggestions and advice. And, and I just being the kind of romantic and passionate that I am, I want to dig into all of this. But I, again, I want to respect your time. And I actually have an appointment coming up here soon. So let's just let's make this even more tangible for our listeners. Will you share maybe a few of the biggest principles? Ultimately, maybe you have already shared some of these, but some of the biggest principles are ideas that have driven your relationship, have enabled you to create a successful and a sustainable working relationship together. Together? Yes, definitely. Respect is huge. And we've already talked about that. But I think purpose is huge, too. Like, we both have purpose in everything that we do. We wake up with purpose. And we wake up with being intentional, intentional on loving on each other, intentional on putting toothbrush, toothpaste on each other's toothbrushes for each other, thanking him when he makes the bed. You know, like, hey, thanks for putting toothpaste on my toothbrush. Not letting that stuff go. Um, it's it's really important to, to to really 
show gratitude in your marriage. And, you know, when things are difficult, when Bob needs time or I need time, that one of the things that we're really good at too is letting each other have time. He goes off and he photographs wildlife and that's kind of his then. And, you know, I go off and do my thing. I just went to Cuba with my girlfriends and, um, and working out has been huge for both of us too. So I know we talked about that. You're respecting your, 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 yourself and your body and your time. I've, I've always exercised and eating right, but then now coming into meditation and more conscious effort of reading about faith, those things as you mature and get older, keep respect and marriage alive. Well, and, uh, you know, I actually wrote down earlier, Bob, when you'd mentioned the significance, or I think you actually said the phrase being selfish with your time. Uh, it plays again on this idea of independence, the significance of independence, giving each other space, as you mentioned, for the sake of that independence. But then it, it makes it that much more enjoyable when you get to come back together, work together, have time together on a personal level. And uh, it, so this has just been a, a really interesting conversation. And I hate that we don't have you know two or three hours to, to dig into it all a lot more, but I cannot thank you enough for making time to share with our listeners your perspective on working together, a little bit about photography as well. And maybe we can have an episode two or three and come back to some of these things. But just in closing, will you share with some of our listeners where, or not some of our listeners, all of our listeners, some of the places that they can find you online, maybe your website as well as social media? Sure. Everything is, is really Bob and Don Davis. So our website is bobanddondavis.com. Facebook is Bob and Don Davis. Instagram is Bob and Don Davis. Twitter is just Bob and Don because at the time I wanted it to be shorter because of the character thing. But yeah, so that's it. That's perfect. Well, we'll make to make sure to link to the site, the social media, and our show notes, any resources that we mentioned during our conversation. Those will all be in the show notes. Uh, for those of you listening in, if you'll just go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com. Um, you can see the show notes for this episode there. But uh, thank you again, Bob and Don, not only for your friendship, uh, but for your example to the industry and, and ultimately for making time for the Boca podcast listeners. Oh, we spent an honor. Nathan. Our pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. We let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app. And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. Thank you.